as well then. <coughs> Good morning. My conflicts of interest are none. We have reasons to measure mechanics, uh, to evaluate the lung and evaluate the chest wall. And if you think about it, we want to know the nature of the clinical problem, the risk of ventilator-induced lung injury, the progression of illness, thinking about the lung, and response to therapy, for example, tidal volume and PEEP, and to evaluate the stiffness of the chest wall and the forcefulness of uh, inspiratory effort. I'm going to be speaking mainly about the lung evaluation, but have some things to say about the chest wall as well. Uh, Antonio set the stage very nicely, uh, talking about the importance of measuring intrapleural pressure if we can, because the same alveolar pressure can be associated with uh, very different lung volumes, depending on what the uh, surrounding pressure is in the pleural space. Which plateau pressure is safest, 40, 30, or 20, will depend on what is the pressure in the pleural space. Now, transpulmonary pressure is the alveolar pressure minus the esophageal pressure. And at end expiration, we can measure that as Dan Telmore did, uh, to try to find a slightly positive value in order for us to assure an open lung at the level of measurement. At the end of inspiration, we want to limit the transpulmonary pressure. And for that, we also need some estimate of intrapleural pressure at end inspiration. Modern ventilators now think it's important enough to record esophageal pressure and compute the transpulmonary pressure so it is something that clinicians will have to be familiar with in terms of what they're looking at. So the esophageal pressure has been under assault in a clinical setting, but in fact in the laboratory setting it's been used since the mid-1950s. Which pressure does the esophageal pressure transmit? Is the reported pressure representative? How do anatomic challenges affect the esophageal pressure? And Really, do we need it? Can we just use the driving pressure, for example, the airway driving pressure? Or do we need to know the driving pressure across the lung? Those kinds of questions. And they keep coming up at conferences like this. Which pressure does the esophageal pressure transmit? It is a 10 centimeter long flaccid balloon partially filled with spiral holes and there are a number of them out there of different characteristics, but they all have fairly flat filling characteristics. So they're relatively tolerant to how much gas is put into the esophageal balloon. Now, if uh, David Cumello and Luciano uh, uh, are in the audience, they will recognize that if you look at the directly measured esophageal pressure, and the number of patients with ARDS, you see that there's a wide spectrum of pressures varying from 5 to 25 centimeters of water, esophageal pressure, with an average in many ARDS patients approximately 12 to 15 centimeters of water. Now that's a very wide range, and people might say the esophageal pressure can't be measuring pleural pressure, can it? Well, let's look at the esophageal balloon itself and put it under water, okay? An overfilled balloon will record both higher environmental pressures and its recoil, its own recoil. The pressure of the water it's in, the level of the water it's in, and the tension inside the balloon if it's overfilled. But as I mentioned before, these balloons are relatively tolerant. An appropriately filled balloon records the lowest environmental pressures and has minimal recoil. Now that's the first important point. Your esophageal balloon catheter is 10 centimeters of water long. I mean 10 centimeters long. What pressure does it project? It's the lowest pressure in the environment. The lowest one. 
Now, if we have the heart sitting on the esophagus, and the literature is full of this baloney, as far as I'm concerned, uh, of the weight of the mediastinal contents invalidating the esophageal balloon. I agree with Laurent on that uh, point very much. It's looking at the lowest pressure in the environment, which probably does not sit under the heart. So point one, the mediastinal artifact may not be so great. And this is a very old slide of mine. Uh, this is the heart of an experimental animal. This is an esophageal balloon. And you see where the tip of the esophageal balloon is in comparison to the vertical axis of the heart. So the esophageal balloon lies under the heart, but it probably records a pleasure that is more relevant to the pleural space. Does the balloon pressure reflect the weight? Sometimes yes and sometimes no, depending on the exact position of the esophageal balloon catheter. If you withdraw it underneath the heart and the heart is big and the diaphragm is high, well, maybe there is a mediastinal artifact. But in most other cases, there is not. You've seen this picture in one variant or another. Uh, this is from Dan Telmore and Stephen Loring's work. If this is the esophagus right here, uh, in this particular projection, it would be more or less at the mid-lung level. And what pressure is the esophageal balloon recording? Probably the pressure in its immediate environment. Now, because Laurent did such a nice job in setting this up, I will say, in summary, that the pressure measured by the esophageal balloon pretty much measures what's at the lateral edges at the same horizontal plane in the supine position. Uh, in the supine position, you might think the heart would weigh on the esophagus, and in the prone position, the heart moves away from the esophagus, and therefore there should be a big improvement in terms of the fidelity of the pressure involved, and you would expect that the pressure would go uh, from a positive value to a more negative value. Correct? Wrong. If you actually look at it, this is the supine tracing, and superimposed the lateral and the prone tracings, and you see that the pressure measured by the esophageal balloon is actually higher in the prone position because of the stiffening of the chest wall, suggesting that the fidelity of the balloon is not invalidated by the weight of the heart. These are wafers that we constructed back in the early 80s with the water filled, and they can, they're flexible so that they can measure the pressure along the surface of the lung. And we put surface wafers near the heart and near the lung uh, in, in varied experiments. Laurent's group has uh, as he just mentioned, put those wafers in dependent, non-dependent positions and compared them with the esophageal related pressure and found that they're very similar. In the pigs, the esophageal balloon pressure and the dependent wafer pressures tracked very nicely. And in human cadavers, the pressure it measured by the esophageal balloon catheter was mid-position as expected, non-dependent, dependent, and the esophageal balloon. So I think we should have more confidence in the esophageal balloon pressure. Is it representative? Well, it does not account for local stress focusing. I don't think we could expect such a technique to do that. It won't reflect exactly the uh, the pressures that are surrounding the most stretched areas or those embedded deeply in the lung at the interface of closed and open lung units that are susceptible to lung injury. But uh, it does have uses for uh, global uh, measurements. Let me, let me pass on here because maybe David will, cut, will uh, expand on this a little bit more. Uh, how do anatomic challenges affect the esophageal pressure? Well, we did a series of exp experiments uh, looking at position, abdominal pressure uh, increases, and non-symmetrical pathologies in my laboratory. 
And uh, this paper published by Gustavo Cortez uh, was here at the conference, I believe. Uh, Unilateral mechanical asymmetry, positional effects of lung volumes and transpulmonary pressure. We looked at the exact question that was asked at the end of Laurent's uh, presentation. How well does the esophageal balloon pressure record the environment when it's highly non-symmetrical with a large pleural effusion on one side, no pleural effusion on the other side? How reliable is our esophageal pressure under those highly non-symmetrical circumstances? We also looked at the effusion supine prone fowler position, 30 degrees, right lateral position and left lateral position, tracking how well the esophageal balloon tracked pleural pressure and therefore transpulmonary pressure. We measured uh, the FRC and found that in these animals, even with the pleural effusion, that the functional residual capacity along the horizontal axis stayed remarkably similar at an expiration and inspiration without a pleural effusion and with a pleural effusion. The functional residual capacity, as expected, went down with a pleural effusion, but notice that as we changed positions, there was not a great deal of difference in the gas measured FRC in these experiments. Now, the transpulmonary pressure also did well. It tracked pretty much what was happening to the gas-filled space. So the first message here is that the transpulmonary esophageal pressure changes are tracking what's going on in the aerated space even with a unilateral large pleural effusion varying the chest wall characteristics in lateral position, prone position, etc. So the transpulmonary pressure changes computed with an esophageal catheter seem to be reliable and potentially useful even in these highly challenging situations. Proning, and I know I'm, I'm running out of time so I'll, I'll go quickly. Proning redistributes lung stress and the, the question is does proning also change the optimal peak value that you might experience as you raised peak uh, in those two situations. Now a negative and expiratory transpulmonary pressure implies compressive forces and the potential for tidal opening and closure. We went over that just a little while ago. Below the esophageal catheter, there is a large space and the pressures down here are presumably considerably higher and the transpulmonary pressures lower than the esophageal catheter would measure. So as Laurent was saying, again, it measures accurately the pressure at its own horizontal level. But remember, there are pressures, transpulmonary pressures that are higher in non-dependent zones and lower in dependent zones. So physiological proning effects that could influence the best peak, it alters the column formation of the lung, stiffens the chest wall, reduces the gradient of trans-lung pressure, and recruits and stabilizes atelectatic lung units. There's every reason to believe that optimal peak in terms of the lung should also be influenced by proning. And we looked at transpulmonary pressure in that setting. And what Joe Keenan uh, demonstrated was Basically, the proning does not consistently shift the optimum peep as assessed by best driving pressure in a decremental setting. I don't have a lot of time to go through this, but basically, the, the supine and prone positions peaked at the same values even when uh, the, uh, the, the, ch the chest wall was stiffened by increasing intra-abdominal pressure. And as far as the esophageal pressure is concerned, here's the transpulmonary pressure and zero transpulmonary pressure, a la Talmor and, and Loring. And we found, again, whether the abdominal pressure was low or high, it crossed the zero point and at the optimal peak point at approximately the same um, uh, point as expected 
uh, based on the driving pressure. How does transmitted abdominal pressure affect the esophageal pressure? Well, if we look at, at uh, esophageal pressure as we raise intra-abdominal pressure, you might be surprised to learn that at the same peak, increase in intra-abdominal pressure does not change esophageal pressure very much because the circuit is open. At an inspiration, the circuit is uh, closed and as intra-abdominal pressure goes up, the delta pressure goes up. And if, uh, if we, we, we find the esophageal pressure going up and the driving pressure calculated from the airway pressure reflects that so that the driving pressure, even with a steady tidal volume, whether it be at peak 1 or peak 10, the, transport, uh, the, the driving pressure uh, by airway pressures goes up, driven by changes in chest wall compliance. But the transpulmonary pressure across the lung does not. As far as thoracic distortion is concerned, I'm running out of time, so I'll just say this. That as we look at non-symmetrical problems, we find still that the uh, transpulmonary pressure does uh, a very good job in tracking what's happening in the aerated space. So do we need it? Uh, the transpulmonary pressure for the end inspiratory plateau and, and true driving pressure and to set peak, uh, I believe that we do need it. In patients who are massively obese, Jacopo uh, Fumagalli and uh, Bob Gesmerick and colleagues reported recently that the, uh, the, the plateau pressures and peaks uh, in those patients were very high, as were the uh, esophageal pressures. And as an example, here is a patient from the Mayo Clinic, again by uh, esophageal uh, uh, again, using transpulmonary pressures uh, calculated with an esophageal balloon. Uh, and it, in massively obese patients, the, the pressures recorded needed to open the lung are really exceptionally high. The transpulmonary pressures are in the range of, uh, in this particular patient, 30 centimeters of water. Bedside applications, set of effective peak, true driving pressure across the lung, uninfluenced by chest wall changes, detecting uh, asynchrony, avoiding excessive transpulmonary pressure, and during active breathing and regulating diaphragmatic loading. Those are things that uh, we haven't discussed uh, yet this morning, but I'm sure others will. Excessive transpulmonary pressures will cause trouble uh, they cause patient ventilator interactions that are difficult to detect with an esophageal balloon, and they may cause diaphragmatic dysfunction if we don't set the effort to be neither too high nor too, too low. Here's my answers in my last slide. Which pressure does, transport, does esophageal pressure transmit? The pleural pressure across its own plane. Is the recorded pressure representative? Yes. For delta pleural pressure and for its local pressure. How do anatomic challenges affect the esophageal balloon? The delta tracks the airspace dynamics, even in non-symmetrical environments like a massive pleural effusion. Do we need it? I think we absolutely need it for vi vigorous spontaneous breathing and probably for, for passive inflation. Thank you for your attention.